so just before I start with the talk, I'm just going to do a little bit of um, housekeeping for, so uh, like this morning's sessions, there will be some breakout sessions from group discussions. Um, and I'm going to be trying to do both giving the talk and managing the uh, Zoom meeting at the same time. So if the people who are attending virtually, you might need to bear with me a little bit. It might take me a while to like run from this laptop to make sure the Zoom session is going as well. And I can't really keep an eye on both at the same time. So, so I, you won't get, so the breakout rooms won't start until probably a, a, a sort of minute or two after I say start the group discussion. So, um, so if, if people could just bear with me a little bit on that. Um, also as well, because there's been quite a bit of turnover in who's online at any one time. I think the original plan was to try and keep all the groups the same on the virtual session. But um, what we were finding is it was getting very unbalanced with the groups. Um, so some groups were having like three people in and some were having ten. So what I'll do is I'll rebalance the groups. Um, uh, for my session, at least, uh, there isn't really... You can sort of relax a bit more, both present and virtual attendees, because I'm not really asking much for you other than, other than to go through the through an exercise. Um, I'll then sort of present the solution as I see it. Um, and then if you sort of disagree with me, you can disagree with me on the Slack and I'll sort of... We can talk through together about, you know, why we disagree and why I'm right. Um, no, uh, no as to, as to, but I, I think for, certainly for my exercises, there's no like one right answer. Sometimes there's a sort of a, a perspective shift, and so we can sort of talk through those things. But yeah, so so there aren't there isn't anything sort of particularly complicated. You don't need to log in onto any whiteboards or anything. So so the feedback doesn't have to be as involved as this as this morning's one. It, it's more that I wanted uh, what I'm trying to get out of the exercise is that we go through sort of some data standardization together, so people can sort of get an, a feel for how one would do it so that people can sort of get a better idea of firstly what it is and how they might apply these principles to their own data. Um, but uh, yeah, as I say, you might need to bear with me a little bit. It might, there might be a bit of a delay um, with, the, with the virtual breakout groups. But for people who are physically here, we'll just keep the groups the same that you've been doing the whole day. I think that's the easiest. Um, um, and uh, for my session, uh, the physical people, each group, one per group, will get a sort of copy of this Darwin Core cheat sheet, which will sort of help you through the exercise. Um, for the people virtually attending, I've pinned a link in the data workshop uh, Slack channel. So hopefully you guys can see that there. Um, and so you should be able to download that. Um, it is, uh, and basically the idea being is it just gives you some sort of some hints and tips and reminds you about what the exercises will be as well. Um, so it, it will help you with the with the exercises. But, uh, but it's, before we get to that though, I'll I'll sort of talk a little bit more of a background for that. But I just wanted to get that housekeeping out of the way first. Um, so yes, yeah, so my workshop. Uh, so I sort of, you may have noticed I renamed it from modeling workshop to data workshop. And one of the reasons why I did that is actually my session isn't really very modeling-y. We're not really going to talk much about stats or anything related to ecological modeling, actually. It's, it's more just about data classification and how we can apply standards to our own data sets. Um, so I, I renamed it the Data Workshop because I figured that would sort of incorporate both my and Bob's part of it. Um, I, I've given it a sort of complicated title, ensuring interoperability by using standardized vocabularies, which is just a fancy way of saying making your data more sort of findable and usable by using a fixed terminology or a known terminology. I guess that's probably a better way of putting it. Um, so I'll do a, a quick refresh. I mean, we've seen this FAIR over and over again, so I won't talk about it too much. So, but we know that the FAIR data principles has these four central pillars, that your data needs to be firstly findable. That means both the data and the metadata need to be findable both by humans and computers. So this actually requires your data set be indexable. That means that your data set has some certain hooks that a sort of automated processor can find your data and understand it in a way that other users can then use that indexing site to find your data. Uh, I guess a, a good comparison would be is if you created a website or a blog post or something like that, um, ideally you want to get that to as many people as possible. So you want your website to be as indexable as possible by search engines, say Google or something like that. And so Google will trawl through and try and find information about your website so that it can satisfy its users' demand for certain web pages. Similarly, if you construct your data in a particular way, you increase the findability of your data set. Um, it also, your data needs to be accessible. So once the data's found your data, um, it needs to know how to get hold of it and what protocol to go through to be able to, 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 to do that. And that protocol needs to be open and standardized. Um, the, the other aspect has to be interoperable, and this is sort of probably another one of the key things we'll talk about today, is that um, 
interoperability in terms of data, what that means is, is it basically says that is your data set interpretable, interpretable in a way that makes sense in the context of other data sets and other applications and workflows? So basically, have you described your data set in a way that, um, that you can understand how to use that data set um, so that you can do larger analyses um, or, or reusing the data for other, uh, other processes or doing meta-analyses and those types of things. And then that feeds directly into reusability. So if your data is interoperable, it helps your data be reusable. Um, so the main things that, that I talk about today is these sort of two, really, because actually by using a standardised vocabulary to describe your data, you actually are maximising these two components of the FAIR data principle. Um, so we've talked a lot this morning about accessibility, about open data and making your data open. I'm going to be sort of focusing more on these two. This is still very important, but, the, but this is really what the standardisation does, is it actually maximises these two. And then Bob, after me, will talk a little bit more about these last two, really, about the Bob's, Bob's stuff will touch on the interoperability, but will also touch about on reusability, crucially, as well. Um, where how do you integrate your data into larger analyses, into bigger stuff? So, um, so hopefully, like one of, the, one of the ways that we've structured these workshops is so that hopefully everyone has a good understanding of each of these four pillars and why each, each of those are very, very important. Um, so one of the things we talk about a lot of the time is this importance of vocabulary. And I think, to a lot of... Uh, sort of field ecologist, this sounds very esoteric. This sounds like something that sort of data scientists would talk about, some eco will talk about standardised vocabularies for data sets. Um, but, uh, and I think probably we, we as a community don't really understand really how important this is. Um, but I think to contextualise it in a sort of field ecological example, as you can imagine here, where you have a, an, an item here, or a species, and you can imagine one ecologist going, great, that's a Camberwell beauty. What a beautiful butterfly. And the other one go, no, it's a sorgacorpa, or morning clope. Even more confusingly, not only is this the Norwegian, but actually this direct translation of the Norwegian is what the Americans would call the same butterfly. Um, and so we, we understand, uh, it's not that ecologists are, are naive to the, the, point, uh, the usefulness of having a standardised vocabulary. It's just that we tend to not really think about it in terms of biological, and so, uh, 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 biological application. And so... Here we've decided as a community that we need to have a standardised vocabulary for this butterfly. And so we'll go, oh, it's Nymphalis antiopa. We come up with this sort of binomial scientific name, name and that has become a standard for, standard for, for most species that we, we choose to describe. And so like, this, we can see in this context, this vocabulary is very important because it stops people talking at cross purposes. It means we know we're talking about the same thing. Um, but when we talk about data, we tend to forget that this vocabulary is still very important. Um, we can sort of use this example as like, we took a sample um, in, without any context or any further information about we took a sample, that, that phrase is largely meaningless. Like, that without, without sort of either having a standardised vocabulary or some metadata to describe what that sample is and how it was collected, um, that means that is a very ambiguous term. And actually, um, in, the, in, in, sort of when, in data management things, language is too rife with ambiguities, particularly in the way that we sort of tend to classically use language in ecology. Um, so, yeah, a sample could be in one of many things. It could be a quadrat with species compositions in it. It could be a distance sampling survey to create population estimates. It could be some eDNA taken from a stream or a river or something, or like many, many other, op many, many other things. And so... Um, the, the, the reason for these data standards is a way of trying to remove some of this ambiguity and have a bit more clarity and a bit more conformity in the way that we sort of describe our data um, so that it actually improves our ability to both meet the findability and the interoperability requirements of the FAIR data standard. So as I said, to, one of the first things to remove this ambiguity that you need to do is you often need to give a greater context for the data. And we've already described this already, actually, but you need to do that through the description of metadata, so uh, some information pertaining to the data and how it was collected, um, because that gives you that extra information to know what that sample means. So that's like, the very first step. Um, but the problem is, as well, is that alone doesn't necessarily get rid of a lot of these ambiguities. If, if, the, if the data set itself is described in an unstandardized way, like if everyone has a different way of describing metadata, then actually, then it, then actually, we end up uh, we end up to the, we end up sort of returning to the same problem of having differing vocabularies, but this time at the metadata level rather than the data level. Um, 
And so this is, this is the argument for why we need these standardized vocabularies, either whether we're talking about data or metadata, is that we just need to, we need to try and minimize this, this ambiguity as much as possible. Impossible. Um, and this is very important because if you're trying to do integrated analysis, where you're trying to use multiple data sets uh, that have been collected in different ways, um, if there are differing vocabularies to describe those data sets, then it becomes less and less obvious how, it, how it's possible to integrate that data. Um, and so these are the sort of things that, if you don't use a standardized vocabulary, you give people like Bob a headache when he needs to then later do some data integration um, work on this, on this data. Um, and I think one of the crucial things as well is we've talked a lot about sharing your data and your metadata, and that is great, and we definitely want to encourage that. But that alone doesn't necessarily mean your data meet fair data requirements, that actually you also have to use a standardized vocabulary to meet the fair data standards. So if you're publishing a journal and you write a data, data journal or something like that, and then you, put, and you uh, archive your data on Dryad, that's great. It'd be an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV file or whatever data format you want. If, but if the vocabulary that you've used to describe that data set is not, doesn't meet a standardized vocabulary, then it's great, you've got open data, and that's not to criticize people who do that. Like, I have plenty of, plenty of uh, publications myself that have only got that far. But what I haven't met in those cases are these more strenuous fair data requirements. And so this, this, this workshop is talking to go, that's how we go that extra mile to sort of go beyond just making our data open, but to making our data open and fair. Um, and I think one of the things I want to sort of address is, um, is that, so this is a slide I put in a bit last minute because actually um, we had sort of, uh, there was a few comments both on the Slack and in person uh, yesterday where people, one of the main worries that people seem to have about data standards was that they were really worried that like, what, what they saw of standards was they meant like a file format standard or they were being told that they had to, pay, they have, to have their data in a very particular file format that would meet certain standards and they were worried that actually what they were having to do was squeeze their data into a different file or table format, format. and they're like, but my data doesn't fit the format, like you can't, it's, there's no such thing as, as, a, as, a, as, as, as a format that's flexible enough to hold all data types. Um, and so I think people are thinking a little bit like this where they're trying to get their data through this standard and it's not going very well. And uh, one of the things I really want to try and sort of disabuse of is this actually isn't the purpose of the data stand of, of these standardized vocabularies. Um, what they're not trying to do is make you necessarily change your data. Like your data table can be in whatever format you want. You can call your columns whatever you want to call your columns in the tables. Um, all this is is the addition of extra supplementary information to improve data in interoperability. So you're introducing to your data your ornamenting your data with a standardized vocabulary that points to parts of your data such that they have standardized definitions. So you can say that this column in this table means this, and it has a, and it has a context outside of just your data set. Um, and so actually, you shouldn't, if you're applying these standards well, you, you shouldn't be losing anything from your data. This information is lossless. You're not losing information. In fact, if anything, you're adding information to your data set. Um, so, so, tr so I think that's one of the things I think we, we say. We, we, I think we became a bit fixated on standards, and we used to, in other parts of life, standards being something we have to meet, and it sort of constrains us. But actually, this is with this type of thing. It's just simply. A, it's like a. Uh, we can think of a lot of these standardised vocabularies as just being a dictionary of terms that you can use, that you can sort of link to certain aspects of your data, to just just to make your data set that a little bit more findable, a little bit more usable by the more general community. Okay, so I'm going to focus on one such standard generally, um, and the, there's a reason for it, but um, uh, there are plenty of standards, and one of the things I do want to point out, the Darwin Core is not the only standard out there. There are plenty of biodiversity data standards that one can go for, um, but I think the one that's probably had the most uptake, partly because the biggest, so, so some of the bigger biodiversity inventory databases tend to have tended to standardize themselves onto Darwin Core standard, and so I think it's probably the probably the most important standard that we need to know uh, as ecologists. Um, I, think, I think that's a fair statement to say. Um, but I don't want to pretend it's the only one um, either as well. So, uh, so, so the Darwin Core standard was developed by TDWD, or TIDVIG, as we've saw. Um, uh, I think Anders talked about the TIDVIG a little bit yesterday, if I remember correctly. I know it was a, I've, I've appeared on someone's slides, a bit of information about TIDVIG. Um, so... They have their acronym because they were formerly known as the Taxonomic Databases Working Group, hence TUDVIG, 
Um, but they've now going under the biodiversity information standards, a more general term, because actually they just aren't they aren't just talking about taxonomic standards now. They've gone far beyond that to just more biodiversity standards. But they still maintain the old acronym, so it's a bit confusing. Uh, <laughs> but as I say, anyone in the know tends to call them Tidvig instead. Um, they are, just to give a bit more context about them, they're a not-for-profit community of taxonomists, curators, ecologists, data scientists. Um, they are actually a very wide group of people, actually. Um, and they largely, through volunteer effort, maintain a number of standards to describe biological data and metadata. So they, ha they are in charge of a sort of number of standards, um, or at least they have sort of... Uh, sort of executive committees that sort of govern how these standards are defined. But that's not to say that this is very necessarily very top-down. This is very community-driven. In fact, actually, I, I attended a TEDVIC meeting a few weeks ago. They were incredibly welcoming, um, and I definitely recommend anyone who has an interest to sort of join, join their meetings to just see what they do behind the scenes. And I think they're also very keen to have people who are very close to the data, particularly for data sets that have been traditionally complicated data sets, sets to describe. I think they're always looking to try and expand these standards, um, and they're usually governed and driven by a desire to meet the needs of, their, of the sort of field data community. And so I think one of the things they're quite keen to do is trying to sort of overcome this sort of supposed barrier between the sort of eco-informatics data science end of ecology and the field ecology end, that actually that they know they have to meet the needs of the ecologists. And I think probably for those of us who ha have a foot in the field ecology camp, I think it's really useful for us to meet them halfway so that we can help guide their standards into something that's most useful to us. Um, but one of the, as I say, lost sound entirely. Oh no, I'm back again. Uh, these, san these standards are incredibly flexible and they're continuously up to emerging needs. So there are complicated data sets that for a long time people would say, I don't know what you'd do with this. So one example is eDNA data sets, where you have groups in there such as operational taxonomic units that are maybe not necessarily like, not necessarily sort of very concretely defined. Those sort of data sets have been traditionally very difficult data sets to deal with. But actually, uh, this this group have been very, a very have been very sort of active in trying to keep up to date with the merging technology and and, de and describing standards. So there are already standards that that. Um, that can describe these complicated data types that, that we're now producing as ecologists that, you know, even five, ten years ago we weren't. But as I say, the most well-known standard is Darwin Core. Um, one last plug for TIDVIG is they are actually hosting a conference next week. Um, so if anyone is interested a little bit more, uh, you can find the conference schedule there. Um, but I definitely, yeah, as I say, I recommend everyone to sort of get involved, um, even if it's just like me. I, I can't say that I'm an active member. At the last meeting, I just lurked and listened to what everyone was doing. I just wanted to, I was, I was basically spying on everyone. Um, I can't say I participated much, but I think actually that in itself is just useful as well, just to get an idea of what, have, of what, they, what these guys are doing for you. Okay, so I'll get into the meat a bit more then. Uh, what is Darwin Core? Um, Darwin Core, like a lot of the other standards, is simply a collection of terms, and I've underlined terms and made it bold because terms has a very specific meaning, meaning that have a very standardised meaning. So terms is just like, if, if we think about Darwin Core being like the name of the dictionary, the terms are the words in that dictionary, in a way. So like each of those words, and then next to that word will be the very precise definition about what we mean by that term, uh, according to the Darwin Core dictionary. Um, a list of the whole list of terms defined by Darwin Core can be found at that website. Uh, it's actually, what's impressive about Darwin Core is it's a reasonably long list, but it's not a ridiculously long list. And it's amazing, it, it's surprising how flexible Darwin Core can be with actually with what is quite a limited vocabulary. So this is one of the first things I think I noticed. I was expecting, when I went on this website, I was expecting like tens of thousands of special terms they had to define to meet for every, t every type of ecological data. But it's actually surprisingly, it's surprising how much ecological data we can describe with so few terms. Um, a few of those terms are defined by, a few of those terms that are in that dictionary also have an extra special meaning, meaning and they tend to get called classes. Um, and they, I think the best way to describe them is they might represent a data type. So like a few of those terms, um, one, one example of a term that is also a class is event, an event. Um, and that is a class, so it's a data type, an event data type. Um, and what classes mean in the, Darwin, in the Darwin Core world is that that is a term 
that itself has other terms associated with it. So an event term might have, uh, so an event term, just to, just to, just an event class, just to give context is, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but an event class is a class um, where you, something has happened at a given time. And so there are certain terms associated with an event class relevant to events, like the time of day or the day of the year and things like that. And so these basically, one way to think about the classes is they're just like groups of terms lumped together. And then there's one term that sort of represents that entire group. Um, I think not so intuitive often for ecologists. So I think I tend to think more about data types. And I think when they define classes, they're normally thinking about like, this class will help handle this data type. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not quite as simple as that, but as you'll see. But I think, that for, I think that's usually a slightly more intuitive understanding for people who are not used to, to handling with Dar Darwin core concepts. Um, and a data set, so your data set, can include one or more classes. So you, you're not limited to just one class. You can have, you know, a, your data set can include lots of tables that are described by lots of different Darwin core classes. Um, as you'll see from this list, if people check it out, there are a lot of terms, and nearly all of them are optional. Um, the, you only use the ones that are relevant to your data set, um, or the ones that you've collected data for. I think sometimes there's a, there's a tendency when you first start getting involved with Darwin Core, where you, t you take a certain core type, and you see all the list of terms associated with that core type, and you think you need to fill in every single term, that you have to have a response for every single term. That's not how Darwin Core was designed. It was basically... You just ignore the ones that are not relevant for your data. Just use the ones that are relevant to your data. If you don't have information on certain of those terms, you don't include it. Like nearly every single one of these terms are optional. There's only a few that are not optional, related to like identification codes that gives your gives your 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 code a unique identifier. But we won't we won't worry too much about that now. But generally, most terms are optional. 